And three, two, one. All right, I'll praise Ishi Elohim. Hey, yeah, yeah. All right, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, we're going to get started. What we're going to do is we're going to discuss uh, some things uh, that happen out in the desert. I hope uh, those of you that went, uh, you appreciated it and, and you understood some things. Um, I don't know if this is going to be a long video. I don't know if this is going to be a short video. Uh, I called for a Passover, a, uh, we believe a total of 39 people showed up. Uh, I just arrived home from, from this event. Uh, I have a household of four, so we, uh, we unloaded and we put things away and about to put my son in the tub. Everybody is taking uh, some kind of moment to, to shower, uh, except for my son and I. He's going to go first, and then I'm going to go. So I believe what I'm going to do is uh, just chronicle the event from, uh, from, from my perspective, my set of eyes. The event was very uh, new to me, hmm. new to everyone else. I am not a big camper. Um, a lot of people aren't big campers. A lot of city uh, brothers and sisters. Um, Go out to start camping. You never know what you're going to get. I was amazed and astonished. Um, all 39 people, uh, including the two uh, uh, guests. Uh, thank you. Without you there, uh, there would be no memory of this. It was amazing from the start to the very end. I <sighs> never see the movie Parenthood. That's what it reminds me of. It reminds me of the movie Parenthood because something that's said between the mom and the dad, life is the roller coaster. All right, it's got its ups, it's got its downs. You have people that come together, you have people that fall apart. You have people that never want to see each other again. You have people that never want to live a day without seeing each other. I can only speak for myself. I had an amazing time. We read the Bible together. We ate food together. We made food together. We camped together. You know, we succeeded together. We failed together. There were successes and there were failures. The success lied within the Passover. Um, some of the failures lied within the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but again, we strove to achieve and we did achieve. So, I really, I'm as surprised as everybody that went out. I'm sure when people went out to the middle of the desert, to the edge of the desert, and said, Right, this is what Jesus warned you about. Somebody calls you off to the desert, right? Don't go, right? And they went and we fulfilled prophecy. We saw miracles. 
created by our own hands, granted to us by the Creator. The things that happen, nobody's ever going to take, you can't take from us. It's already made its moment in history. The time that the people spent with my son. All praise the great Mashiach. Look, with 39 freaking strangers, you, you don't know what to expect back and forth. Okay? And I don't feel that there was anyone there that I couldn't trust. Now, the problem with some of the people that did come is the Passover was called by me. And a few people had the attitude that uh, you are not my teacher and you are not my dad, so you're not going to tell me what to do. And we can't have that. Nobody made any statement that they're your father. Nobody said, Luke, I'm your daddy. You're going to do what I say. So those kind of things get out of proportion. But it is what we make it. And we all made it in something I feel beneficial. Even the people that didn't agree. And everybody has a right to their own opinion. So let's start it off. All right, so we got down there uh, probably about to 26, 27. And uh, you saw from the previous uploads, we we went into this uh, this resort. It was pretty nice. You know, because uh, for not camping before, to be able to camp there and use their facilities and stuff makes it a lot easier to, like, you know, right before you drop into the just full-on desert. Uh, <coughs> they had shower water. Uh, they had a sauna. I mean, I didn't use that stuff. I'm, I'm sitting there trying to enjoy uh, what I got, you know. Um you know, and, and when I got as a family, and I didn't have a family before, and it's amazing that in seven years, um, this is what it's grown to. Mm. And so while I'm trying to adjust to camping and being away from home, you know, um, you tend to neglect your family a little bit, but it becomes what it becomes, and you move on and eventually either learn to hate them or learn to appreciate them, and that's just the way things go. So, we got out there, and we started camping, and uh, one thing I don't tend to do is cover my face when I'm camping, and uh, that seems to be the the main thing that you should do so that you don't get sick. So, right off the bat, I got a little desert cold. And, uh, we camped out there for, uh, about five days before everything got started. Uh, no, about four days before everything got started. You know, it's, it's still rough, you know, it's outdoors. Um, it's a resort. You're still camping there, so they got pebbles instead of sleeping on the, the dirt. You're sleeping on pebbles. I know somebody's gonna say, "Oh, you smoke cigarette," and I'm just gonna say, "Oh, you know, indigenous people and tobacco." And I really don't understand uh, where people, you know, get these thoughts from. You know, um. Like, you read the Bible, you read the scripture, so you're supposed to be, like, some super hell freak, and all this stuff, uh, 
I mean, that's just your own perception. And, uh, you know, most of the people that make those comments, they're actually people that have been blocked over and over again and keep coming to the channel because they're paid to create minor disturbances within the thoughts of the people that are watching. So, I got used to camping out there, got used to seeing the place, uh, driving around, eating, um, eating from pots and pans out in the wild and then cooking from them. That's, that's, that's what we did our, our few days. Um, I spent a few days building some headbands. I never got around to some of the ones I built. So, uh, we really didn't go sightseeing in the area. Really didn't, really didn't feel it inside. So, uh, the first four days had to do with a lot of, uh, guiding people in. One of the things that had happened is, uh, while we were guiding people in, we met the first person that arrived. It was uh, Jerome. Now, uh, Jerome, he had suggested we go into the BLM area and uh, a verge and, and start looking for camping uh, spots. And when we looked for a spot, uh, they had little markers. Now, if you didn't uh, see a camp spot, little marker, you weren't, you weren't supposed to camp. So, it gets pretty gets pretty ridiculous. So uh, Jerome had found a spot and it was between uh, uh, where construction crew was quarrying and across from where they were, uh, their, their, their fenced off gate was. But it was still in the open land. So we tried to go there. We spent about an hour and a half clearing off this, this, this area. Try to level it to be able to put up a big tent uh, that's when this fat gay guy came over on an ATV, started talking shit. Uh, started talking to my wife. I went over to approach. Uh, I go, about 10 feet out. I go, hi, how you doing? He says, hi, and then he keeps talking to her. So I said, Stephanie, come here. And so he, so he mumbles like, oh, boy. And I go, oh, boy, what? So me and him got into it real quick. You know, and uh, I'm like, uh, you know. What's going on? And he says, hey, you gotta be you gotta be over here by these uh camp markers. The thing is, when you go up thirty feet, there's a white um person that has their AT uh their R V. You know, when you go up fifty more feet, there's another uh white family and they've got tents. So, you know, in the areas, guess what? The areas they were in were not marked. So, you know, it gets a little bit like, you know, hey, nigga. Yeah, you know, so, yeah, I got no argument with that guy real fast, you know. Um, so much so that, uh, you know, when this guy leaves, you know, you know, everybody that's with me is like, you shouldn't have did that. Take it easy. And I'm like, well, why should I do that? See, you didn't do that in the last generation, and that's why we're in this predicament. You know, it's a, so, um, so I made that upload explaining we would be going back to Mark's land. So we went back to Mark's land, and that's where we met Chuck. Uh, Chuck is uh, a major landowner out there on, on the lot, and Mark has a parcel on the lot. Now, a lot of people have parcels on the lot, you know, it's just uh, Chuck was out there wondering what we were doing, so he helped us out and pointed us in the right direction where Mark's location was. So, once we found where Mark's lot was, then we started working again. Now, by the time we found where Mark's lot was, there was about 10 of us. People got there pretty quick about uh, two Two, two, three, three days till, two days till. You know, it got, it got pretty interesting. And you know, uh, it was cool. I got to meet our Silro next. Uh, when we were still at the resort, our Silro came in, and he brought Boaz. Uh, uh, I just remember Boaz's name. So, 
so vividly. Um, he was the lamb that that Arsila Rose set, along, set aside. Excuse me. Um, and Cherie, uh, Arsila's wife, and they were a very interesting uh, couple. And 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 me and her hit it off pretty well. You know, she didn't take too much of my shit, so you, you, you can't beat that. You know, and she didn't really want to argue either. So <laughs> there's just like. You got your room, I got my room, we're doing it. So it was real cool. And our Silro, he's a pretty cool guy, you know, and he had a nice nice little dog. And uh so then it was uh Jerome or Silro Sheree. <coughs> my family. Um next uh Joe and Adrian came in and they were great, you know. Um wonderful guys, man. You know. Um, they came in and, uh, while we were still at the resort and then, uh, uh, on the final day at the resort, all three of us, uh, rolled out and then we went and tried to find room at the land. And, uh, that's when more people started arriving. That's when it all started to kick off. Now, it's about 10 of us and we started to, uh, camp in, in, on the land, but it was not necessarily the correct spot, <coughs> so Chuck filled us in where the correct spot was, and once we narrowed all that out, um, then we had ourselves a uh, nice little party going, um, I believe you did, uh, the Chapman brothers, these are twins. These are twins, but from uh, different different sets. So one twin from one set and another twin from another set. Like, but yeah, it was great. Man. And those, all those guys are very helpful to each other. You know, um, it it came to a point where a lot of us realized that the other people need help they have not been camping before so assisting people as they arrived and then helping everybody each other set up their tents and you know uh you know i'm I'm a dick so i would just you know you know have you read the instructions i had to read the instructions you should as well so once we got all into our instructions and everything everybody's time went up very okay uh so uh that, that was it was it was pretty much uh the end of that day and uh nothing really stood out and then that's when uh other people came and then uh let's see Otis and his wife and family had arrived by then and, uh Zachary T uh, top aka top cat uh they arrived um and and people from all over the country. Joe and Adrian, uh, one's from uh, New Jersey, the other one's from uh, Atlanta. Mark uh, didn't make it, he was supposed to, but, you know, he's from Florida. Um, Lewis was from uh, Baltimore. You know, there was, there was guys from everywhere. Corrales from, what, San Diego or uh, something like that. Saying something. Um, Otis, California. He's in Seattle. Uh, Albert, North or South Dakota or something, one of those, you know, double states, you know, up north. It, it, you know, uh, wow. Well, Kenny, uh, Texas, I, I mean, look. <laughs> From the four corners of this continent, people came. It was amazing. Everybody had a hard time making their way there but you know <laughs> i you know uh the, the chap the, Ch the chapman twin brothers were uh from uh what missouri people from everywhere you know um and again for people to come out to the desert you know and uh you know on on you know teaching it, it, it it's it's amazing it's just amazing um the top from arizona man i mean 
ladies and gentlemen, we had people from everywhere. We had family from Colorado, you know, um, you know, we had people from everywhere. And well, some people agreed, and uh, some people didn't agree. You know, we uh, finally got to meet uh, Demario and Charlisa face to face. You know, Winifer finally said, "I got to meet Winifer, man." Jason is great. I mean, Jason. I, you know, um, the next day came, and uh, we realized we had to do like uh, runs to the city. You know, um, the land is about uh, 51 miles from the city. <clears throat> so we all gave ourselves assignments. And uh, we started shooting around, getting everything that we needed. We knew our cellar, our cellar had a, a lamb already set aside uh, as the law states. And uh, we thought about getting more lambs. We tried to attempt to get more lands, lambs. Uh, our cellar took that task because he already had one. And um, he informed me when he went and tried that uh, they just gave him the glass ceiling. Right? We're... Uh, where they said they're they are lambing these lambs for 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 right now um which meant for easter and uh you know we had already driven by and it's all literally when i would tell people i i could i could literally see a thousand sheep i saw about when you drive by this place on the expressway you see hundreds of lambs you see a bunch of sheep and there were little lambs that they had three four five sometimes more are right by the parents and i mean <sighs> these people had to have like close to a thousand sheep just right there and then they uh we thought about going and recording them uh trying to give us this uh christianity bullshit and then assuming later but you know, something about that kind of just uh, put a sore taste in your mouth. So we, we just avoided it altogether. Um, when we uh, were going into this, there were conversations with specific people that we talked about how when you look in the scripture, there are many, many lambs being brought. All kinds of numbers are reached, you know. Uh, when they leave Egypt, they have their lambs and sheep with them. When they have the next Passover, uh, they have the continuance of that flock, right, and so forth. When David has it, right, he, you know, thousands of of, of lambs and, and, and right, right uh, you know, uh, excuse me, hundreds. When Hezekiah has it, uh, what is thirty thousand lambs are brought in, so it's thirty thousand families, something like that. You know, so as you see, like, every number is reached. There is no written story of just one lamb to feed a giant family of Israel. So, we knew that was the number. It was, uh, it was interesting. It's interesting. Give me a moment. All right, so. Ah, it's nice and chilly. Um, <laughs> my temperature's still off a little bit. I don't know. It's weird. So, uh. So we started reading together, we started praying together, and uh, uh, everybody started coming in. All right, so once we got so many people there, then uh, uh, a few problems started to arise, you know. Um, I had been having some problems outside of this with uh, a group of men that were talking privately, and the more they talked privately, the more they made their point clear that you know you're not my teacher and I have things that I want to teach you know so I expressed to to the lead of these men that eh, I don't give a shit what you teach you know teach it on your own time you know don't uh 
you know, me calling for a Passover isn't, you know, your opportunity to teach the people that have no idea who you are, you know, like, uh, you know, build, build a channel like anybody else did, you know, build yourself a church, you know. So, you know, this didn't go over well with me and this didn't go over well with them. You know, it led to one of the people pushing me and then, uh, you know, it's when all hell broke loose for a minute. Um, that was as physical as it got, um, just me being pushed. But, uh, you know, uh, what was going on with this person, uh, you know, I have no idea. Uh, but I had a feeling everybody still needed to be there uh, from start to finish. As it moved further, uh, in the next day, everybody got their ass in gear and uh, got things assigned at different places and uh, got more things completed. At this point, we had a lot of the, the wood in the ground for the uh, temple. Um, and we had Otis making runs to build uh, an altar, and uh, we were making we were making a lot of progress. All right, so the uh, day of the Passover. Um, I'll say this about the Passover. Uh, I understand a lot more uh, now than I did going in. Um, I understand how long it takes to cook lamb. Uh, there's so many things I say about what happened to that day. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, one of the things that happened was every night the sun set around six o'clock but on the third then it started to change we expected to start cooking the lamb around six but the process of everything didn't get the lamb started to cooking until around uh, nine but the sun stayed up two hours later i would dare to say it was around 8 30. i mean i could always go and look at the time and when the sun set in utah uh that, 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 that but, but I, I tell you i think it really stayed up to about 8 8 30. and everybody was really kind of shocked like wow man and like then nobody had prayed for this and that was kind of odd it was odd because the day before the day before, we were all outside working to build our little tent city and to build the temple, and the weather was real bad, and it started to rain. And everybody was working through the rain, and at some point, I had had enough and realized that we couldn't go any further if, we, if the rain came down any harder for any longer. So I asked everybody to come over and to join hands. And we prayed to the Ishi Aloha that the rain stopped. And it did. That blew everybody away. And then, a little bit later, this giant rainbow came out. It was, it was, it was just... And... And then, yeah, when we were on a run, Adrian and Joe saw another rainbow um, around the sun. And the rainbow around the sun happened first. And then it started to rain the next day. And then we stopped the rain. And then the giant rainbow came. Oh man, it was just, it was just a roller coaster. <laughs> you know. And the whole, you know, and, 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 you know, and people having 
you know, good times and bad times along the way. It, uh, it, it was amazing. So the nights were cold. Even when we were uh, at that resort, there was a, a real bad night, and uh, so cold we woke up with frost on us. That's that's the day I think I was sick, and I think my son got sick too. My wife tends to put too much on him. It'll get hot in the middle of the night. He'll just climb right out of the uh, out of the sleeping bag. When we we taco, you know, two two sleeping bags together, you know, and make it, you know, so but that doesn't help either because she'll cuddle them and make them hotter and they'll crawl faster. So, you know, so then me and him were sick, you know, and uh, we're just getting used to all this, you know, kind of living out of the car and then camping and real camping. Once it got to the real camping, wow. That you know, my family is so much stronger than I than I am. My mom didn't want to come; she just came uh, for for my son. And truly, for me, you know, my wife was there. I never once said I want to go home. My son. He never once said he wanted to go home either. He had a sick moment where he threw up all over my wife. It's like a Nickelodeon TV show. Oh, can you imagine being on the road? No. No. I mean, there's laundry mats, you know. There's no place to really clean up or anything. You know? Ah, man. They're champs. They went the distance, the guys. They, they they really went the distance. So Otis uh Otis turned himself into the hero uh on the day of the Passover. Got all the bricks for the altar, you know. Um had 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 the right tools to get the temple up in enough time. You know, um It really came true for everybody. So, we had the Passover. And then the lamb was taking a long time to cook. And we had to have everybody pile into the tent that's supposed to be on the tent. Anybody that's not supposed to be on the, uh, inside of the tent, they become a security. You know, and uh, it's fun, you know. There's a there's a mystical essence, you know. There's a there's a spiritual essence. There's a there's a fear essence, you know. There's a paranoia essence. There's all this stuff that's going on the whole time in everybody's mind. And you can see it on everybody's face, you know, from the slaughtering of the lamb to to putting the lamb uh, on on a rod. You know, um, it was just amazing. You know, and you have people saying, oh, are we supposed to slaughter these things? And you just have to say, dude, didn't you just go to the grocery store and buy lunch meat? And you don't even know what that thing was slaughtered to. You don't read the food laws. But you're saying, oh, don't slaughter to the... To the one that created us. You are truly the devil. Just trying to hold on to more time. So. The Lamb of Passover. That was very interesting. To watch. Uh, the life being taken. To watch the lamb be uh, uh, de-skinned and defanned. Ah, uh, tied on to a rock. 
Those were some very interesting things. Never saw that before. Thought I would be, you know, queasy about it. No, no, it was all right. No, it was all right. Um, then cooking the lamb. That was, that was the interesting thing because it takes a long time. Now, I believe there are a few different ways to do it. We did, uh, uh, in a rotisserie attempt. Um, and that took a very, very, very long time. I presume the, uh, the, the, the most effective way would be um, something that we didn't do. So, as we use a rotisserie way, we churned and turned and let sit and lowered one side and lowered the other side. I, that's what I feel. I basically feel if you have a principle of lowering it, like uh, you have some kind of chains, and you can lower the lamb. And because uh, this design that is written out in the Bible is immaculate. To be able to cook the lamb until the in innards burst off and burn off, uh, and then that's 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 how you know when it's done. That's that's some badass stuff. I gotta admit, that's pretty badass. We know none of us, for the most part, had ever done anything like this. You got to understand. Once, uh, once the stomach got uh, inflamed, uh, what it did was kind of turn into this bubble. It, the weight of the stomach and the gases turned it into this huge egg shape and it hung on the outside of it for so long. It was kind of weird, you know, <laughs> I never saw anything like that. And then the other side, the intestines were coming out and they were cooking. And then once they got to a part where you thought that they were solidified, then some juice would squirt out and you'd be like, yeah, no, that shit ain't done yet. <laughs> That's that's yeah, and then you could see all the fecal matter once the insides got to a certain degree, it poured out. You know, all it had to do with was cooking the organs until they either burnt off or their 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 internal stuff poured out. Now that happened over hours. Let me tell you, when that egg, when that thing was dangling, it had this down egg. It was like it was big. It's big as it had to be like that, right? And it's just hanging from the side of it, you know. And then uh, the fire started cooking the outside of it. So I thought that she was, uh, push, I push, kept saying, Get back, it's gonna get on all of you. Oh, that was the nastiest thing. Now that thing did not bust, it just kept heating and heating and heating. I had to check on other things when I came back. They told me it, it, it broke off and fell into the fire, and I just, oh. <sighs> And that was gone. There's still another piece there. I think that was the liver, and then that took a while too. So that's when we started lowering it into the fire to make sure we could cook the parts that were necessary to be cooked. Um, it's about 4 a.m. Uh, hold on, let me start that one again. So at about 4 a.m., the lamb was finally finished. So then we started cutting off pieces and uh, started sending them into the people that were asleep. We had them wake up and uh, take their portion. And uh, when we were satisfied, we put it in, as the scripture tells us, and burned the rest. And then we went into the tent. And we started waking up in the morning. And we prayed that uh, the things that we did not achieve law-based, that the Most High would bless and accept our efforts. Yeah, it was a pretty great day. Pretty, pretty great day.
<laughs> so then, uh, next day, that's when all heaven, you know, broke loose on us, and uh, everybody started talking about spirits and whatnot. Uh, you know, the spirit felt like that, you know, and, uh, you know, their own perspectives, not like, you know, I really don't know how to word that one. So I wake up uh, around 3 p.m. because I'm just exhausted, right, uh, from from everything that happened. Uh, I wake up like around uh, 9 or 10, and, and then everybody just told me everything's fine. Go back to bed, get some rest. So I went, that, I went back to bed, and I woke up at 3 and like some of the guys were munching on the dinner for the, a piece of unleavened bread, and uh, I was, you know, I, I said, guys, you know, um, it's a dinner for the unleavened bread, and somebody said to me, "Yeah, you better get some before it's all gone." <laughs> oh, I just turned back to my tent and just went right back to sleep. I just, I didn't have the energy for it, so. You know, they you know, didn't mean anything by it. So that started the who's prepared and who's not prepared. You know, because we had enough food for everyone for 20 days, okay, uh, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But the in-between snacks is, is it's everybody else's responsibility. Uh, we had enough snacks for children for the in-between snacks. So we had enough food to feed all the adults, breakfast, lunch, dinner, all the children throughout the day. Um, and with that being done, um, you know, I, I had um, a couple of people that started taking advantage of that. Um, and, and I really didn't appreciate that. And, and, and I had to make some comments and, and then things, you know, once you start to get to the sixth comment, the seventh comment is not going to be nice. It's like, that's one of my rules here. Um, people want me to talk nice to them. And the problem is, if I ask you once, I'm going to be kind. When I ask you again, I'm going to be a little candy-ass. But once I start getting a third, fourth time, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty aggressive at that point. Because I've wasted my time, and I don't want to waste my time. So, you know, at the seventh time, hey, stay the fuck off the table. You didn't bring any food. Uh, I told you to. I told you to bring food to eat for days. And then I went and bought the food anyway. So all you had to do was provide your own snacks. So... You know, I had to tell people to stay away from the table and stuff, and then that grew out of proportion because once I told them to stay off the food table and another person told them to stay out of the kitchen as a whole group to everybody, these guys go into the kitchen and start going into the wine. You know, uh, the wine that, you know, uh, somebody else purchased for everyone, their donation everyone. You know, so when you start to have that kind of shit going on, you know, now um, I'm offended. You're taking advantage of me. I don't want to be taking advantage of you, you know. And that's just minor shit, you know. I don't really give a shit at the end of the day. But I really don't want to deal with people if I have to lock things away specific times you know yeah so again we still have arguments of people a select group of people pushing you're not the host you don't own this land it's god land you know and you have to say hey over there it's chuck's house that's chuck's cabin why don't you go over there and start fucking around in Chuck's yard and see if you don't come out saying it's his property with a shotgun. You guessed here. And just because the owner of the land isn't here, you don't have to act that way. 
And that was another big problem. A couple of attitudes. Um, seemed like they came with a chip, and they wanted that chip knocked off. But uh, that promotes a lot of shit. So if you start smacking people and shit, you know, then the next guy is like, I don't want to get smacked. I didn't come here for that. So it leads to a lot more delegation that I'm not very used to. <laughs> but we got through. So it, it was what we made it. You know, I really don't like that attitude. It is what it is. And this is why we all have heartbeats. Because anything here can be changed. So. <coughs> as we all started spending a lot more time with each other. And we started to notice all the freckles. On all these brothers and sisters. And it always reminds me of what Brother Sam and Mike said. I can't remember what book he got it out of. But he talked about how the Levites would have freckles. Then that reminded me of how Vincent would say. You know, um, the Bible says, you know, the Levites, uh, well, I think, are, are what's supposed to come together. You know, and, you know, when Vincent says that, I'm kind of like daydreaming, and I'm just like, you know, where does he say that? And, you know, now I, now I have to ask him because now I saw it. So at this point, we've taken some time. We read from Genesis 17. Uh, in the 25 or 26, I think we got up to 27 or 28, not quite sure. Uh, no, 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 I remember when we were at 26 and I was like, that's nine chapters and we kept going. Um, we read Jeremiah, the beginning of Jeremiah, we read a few chapters in Jeremiah. We read the beginning of Nehemiah's group and it was great. We noticed very interesting things. How... Moabites, or a particular Moabite, assisted the Israelites in rebuilding the temple. And it is interesting that how more things reveal itself through the scriptures that we that we ever bargained for. If you open up to Jeremiah chapter 1, start reading, you're going to find out that Jeremiah is a child and he, he can't talk well at all. And he can only speak the word of the Most High because the Most High put his words in Jeremiah's out, mouth and, and sent him out to destroy the nations. <laughs> And if you read Jeremiah, you will see that is exactly what happened. So when you see those little portraits of the little black boy with the little afro that's in a night timer, that's Jeremiah, the prophet. So as we're reading Jeremiah, it discusses colonization specifically. I invited the families of the north to come and lay siege upon you. When we started to read the Bible of these chapters and verses, we found out that Jeremiah is being sent to Judah, to the Judeans. Jeremiah is telling them, they're about to be destroyed. And Jeremiah is sent to Benjamin, who is on the Judeans. And Jeremiah says to the Benjamites of Judea, and says, you need to leave, because I'm about to destroy them. So, Judah was destroyed. And me thinketh, it was by Jeremiah on the, on the issues of orders. Now, what is Utah? Well, first off, we knew we were in the right place because 
Every day, when we looked directly above our head, the Big Dipper kept getting closer and closer and closer. So we knew what was going on. We knew by the end of the feast, by the, ele the 11th, the Big Dipper would be directly over our head uh, the night of the 10th, right, the morning of the 11th. And it would be pouring upon us, just like Scripture said. So I believe at this point, the Most High started to shift and sift. Now, Uh, I'm going to bring this up real quick. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. Oh. Uh, isn't it funny? How oh, man and woman are created right here. Let them make us, uh, our image. And, it, and, and when you sit here, it says, here's a creation of man and woman. Isn't that funny? Well, what's created in one one? Okay, so. Um, here, Eve gets cursed. All right. The woman and the serpent, right? And the woman's curse, right? Woman, thou hast done, woman, the serpent should be God, and did eat. God said unto the serpent, because thou did this, I'll be enmity between he and she and Adam, because thou uh, hearkened to the voice of thy wife has eaten, is now, listen to this. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of thee the tree, which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. And in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life thy life so you, you have to eat what vegetables to stay healthy <laughs> right thorns that's a last name that's a code and thistles that's companies Shall it bring forth thistle down, right? Irish last name thorns. Better wake up. Shall bring forth to thee, and shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat. Now Adam's wife is called Eve because she was the mother of all the living. And Adam, the wife, right, made coats. Uh, hold on, where is her curse? And then you'll, you'll, you'll eat the herbs, and then you'll return to the to the dust. But the curse on the woman. Uh, I think it's still back in three. It's to be subjugated. Let's see real quick if I can find it uh, shortcutting. Oh, that's not spelled right. It's three sixteen. All right, so let's go to 3 and 16. And this is the key to everything. 
Oh, right before that. Under the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and thy conception and sorrow shall bring forth children. They shall desire, but and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. Okay, so when you're in a relationship and your husband is not ruling over you, you are not dealing with the curse of God. You're actually going against God. If you wear the pants in the family, that's not a godly family. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. If the woman wear the pants, the man wearing the skirt. All right. <clears throat> so when my wife got out of hand, I tried to correct my wife and choke the living shit out of her. I'm just joking, but I did try to smack the shit in my wife. Um, some of you guys had to break it up. They suggested, I'll take your wife back to camp. And we were on a run to go get something. I said, sure. That sounds very good. Because we'll both have some time to cool off. So I go get my shit. I see that person at the store. Things are great. Go back to camp. I got a bunch of people running their mouth at me all at once. No. I really don't care. They don't live here and they don't respect the law. The law is the law. If man is supposed to rule over woman, I don't give a shit what any other woman says because they don't wear my ring. So, at this point, people took it upon themselves to complain to me how they felt about my relationship. I received some advice prior to this. And the person advised me, don't react to any of this. Something's happening here. Let it happen. After some of the fiascos that happened in the previous days, I said, yeah, this is kind of the advice I got the other day, so I'll just let things happen. So, one family where the woman is controlling the husband starts running off at the mouth of me and calls me all kinds of names, a false prophet, a charlatan, a crook, a thief. So then starts making accusation that I stole money from them, stole money from other people, wasted money. Just start saying all kinds of shit. So I just listened. And then her husband says, oh, yeah, this ain't right. You did this. You did that. And I said, what did I do? Then they started bringing up their donations. And I said, I have the records here. That's the whole point of the computer and email addresses. What about your donations? Because I probably, I probably know what they donated. I had only just started dealing with him. I talked to the man on the phone. The man said he had a seven-person family. I think there's a few viewers that can verify this when i tell people when, they, when people tell me they got big families or they got problems in their families and, and they're interested in the stuff i just say you know just make a small donation and i'll just take care of what you want this man said he wanted five headbands and two t-shirts everybody knows one t-shirt's 25 dollars. everybody knows one headband is 25 dollars just, I just said, dude, just give me a hundred bucks. I'll send you what you ask. Now, we're there on the spot, and she's calling me a liar and a thief. She has no idea I sent them all kinds of free shit. That Earlier that day, every shirt that I took out there to sell, I never said one thing about selling. I went around and passed out all the merchandise. To all the people that came. All this woman wanted to do was tell me how 
evil I was and how I did them wrong. I kept grooming off the food half the time, yelling at them because this person brought all, all the, a lot of children. She didn't bring seven children, she brought five. But again, I believe there is something else going on. Even though we're in the desert, it is not cheap to stay in the desert. I believe that they, uh, they had some issues existing out there, and they were looking for an opportunity to leave. But all the name calling, the accusations, uh, the, the the wicked display, the show that she controls the family that the man doesn't. It's all just tasteful and disheartening. But you're going to get what you're going to get. And that's what I got. I got some and it took the opportunity. Just like the other person that shoved me in the chest. This person just wanted to take verbal shots and tell me I was wicked and evil. Okay, so you said your piece. So. When they were hungry out there, I didn't, I didn't do anything but give them what I brought for everybody. When they ran out of gas out there, who runs the fuck out of gas in the desert? I ain't do nothing but do but nothing the same thing I would do for anybody else. But then they... <sighs> you know... Shit happens sometimes. That's all I can say about that. So, the next day is the day we brought the bow out, and it, it thinned out to a good amount of people. We had about uh, 12, 15 people at that point. Um, and it was all men except for my family. Um, at that point, I felt pretty good. I, I gotta tell you, after the previous stuff, you know, some people may be, you know, be discouraging, especially some of the people there might have been discouraging. But, uh, no, this, uh, this made me feel really good. At that point, just like I perceive that I am being pushed to shake up a beehive, we got shook up, you know, because, again, when you call for a Passover in the desert, and it is by uh, visual media, uh, you cannot truly guesstimate what you're going to be dealing with. You know, what comes, comes, and what doesn't, doesn't. And that's pretty much what you have to go on. So, for what it was, it was great. It was amazing. Um, A lot of people went their own way after that. I will say that uh, because of those series or string of situations, there were some people that decided to go uh, look at the parks for a few days and, and came back. Uh, there are some people that uh, decided to go and look at the parks and not come back. Um, it was really good. It, it, it was great. The people that didn't go and look at the parks, uh, we we brought the bow out and things got fun. For, things got fun for a little bit. Um, a lot of these men never shot a bow and arrow, so just set them up with some minor shooting uh, and, and showed them how to put it together and put it apart. Um, the bow I had is very 
uh, strong. So you have to use your whole body to be able to assemble it. Meaning take the string on and take the string off of the bow. Um, that was one of the challenges for everybody. You know, uh, I'm going to show you this way. This, this bow is very big. You're going to lock it in with your knee. Um, hold your weight down with your thigh and your upper body. And uh, string it and de-string it before you can shoot. <coughs> so, <coughs> I had the first group string it, de-string it. And shoot, and uh, it was great. They took uh, they took five shots, six shots, just out into the open desert. Um, uh, pretty good, pretty good uh, angle. You know, once once they shot the bow, you know, they could see the arrow reach high into the wind, move in the wind, then come back down, and you know, and then you know, once people, uh, you know. You got five shots, six shots, you know, once you, once you start understanding the feel of it, and then you just, and it's, it's just open desert. And, you know, a lot of these guys, you can see the childhood smile. I mean, you've never seen these guys, in this chat, you know, you just know, like, that's what that motherfucker looked like as a child. He's so happy with the way. All right, uh, Tim. Can't remember where Tim was from. I think he's from uh, East Coast. But Tim got to shoot, man. Uh, Tim shot to shoot. Boy, his face lit up so fast. He was just, he was proud of himself. You know, it was, it was amazing. Carell too, you know, um, Carell's from the West Coast and, and you know, uh, he was, he was kind of shy, but not really, you know, once he got to do it. Lewis, you know, he seemed like, you know, he doesn't have that, that you know, he seemed like he had, you know, arms my size, you know, not that strong or anything. Lewis shot the, I, I think Lewis could have shot the moon, man. You know, moon was pretty close one day, man. Lewis got into that. Um, everybody got into it. We had Devontae. Devontae is like 6'2", 6'3", with, uh, with the right shoes on, man. He's, he's gigantic size, man. You know, not like giant size, but, you know, athletic, man. Um, you know, he, he had a blast, too. So, once I had him do the standing shot, I had him do, like, a running, you know, kind of jump shot kind of thing. And, you know, they had a blast with that, you know. And, and it was just, you know, it was just going back and forth. Uh, Jerome bought, brought his uh, compound, and he was over on the side uh, hanging out. And Yazid brought a bow, and uh, he, he went over there and uh, showed him showed him how to shoot. Um, so, we, we just showed people just different ways to shoot. You know, and then uh, there was a point, like, I tried to show this one guy how to shoot, and then he started this, you know, you're not my dad, you know, and you're not my teacher, you know, and I don't have to do it this way, and I'm just like, look, you're kind of shorter, and the boat is freaking gigantic. Everybody else that's went, you know, and then, and that turned into some shit, you know, and so eventually, like, uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, Otis uh, wanted to go see some sites, and and that guy went with him. And Otis said to me, "Hey, I think it's time for me to go." And uh, I said, "I understand." And uh, Otis uh, and his family, and that guy left. And uh, you know, we were down. I think we were about down to twelve about that time. Um, but you know, there's nothing I can do. Like. I'm showing you just exactly how I showed everybody else, you know, not doing it one step differently. And if you can't appreciate that, it's because I think you got a chip on your shoulder. You got to deal with that chip. It's it's not me. I don't, I don't have to deal with that, you know. So it was what it was, and it became what it was, you know. So, give me a minute. All right, sorry about that. Kind of squeezed out a little burp a second ago. Oh, I'm so tired. Oh, I don't even know how long I've been gone. Oh, so. All right, so we get our last drop off. Okay, so. 
the crown count everybody i think that's when we were about 12 and i was like wow that's like the freaking apostles right like you know it was crazy you know so uh, a couple more things that happened before that we had another mystery of things all right um Crow goes and gets his laser, right? And he grabs his laser and he's like, and goes shooting up into the stars, right? And his thing was brighter than the stars, right? And then we're looking at the Big Dipper because it's like, it's kind of really above our head, you know? And one of the, one of the things with Dipper and he's kind of lighting it up, you know? And then all of a sudden he just turns it off, right? And then uh uh DeMar i think it's demario had a telescope we have a telescope we have a scope bring in we just i forgot all kinds of stuff i forgot the telescope and i forgot the metal detector man wow the fun we would have had if i brought the metal detector i don't think he wanted me to bring the metal detector we wouldn't have figured out anything that we figured out if we brought the metal detector so demario brings the telescope out right all of a sudden a black cloud comes across the sky and blacks out all the freaking stars everybody's walking around astonished like what just happened right i don't know what made tomorrow do it takes some telescope back and then ooh, the cloud's gone and the stars are back out understand we're in the desert. All we got is a big fire and some. Well, we got fire and, and some tiki's, man, in the stars. I guess that's all you got for light, besides your lights, and your lanterns and stuff. You know, we all saw it. You know, we 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 had all witnessed that. We, that was it was just amazing. And whatever was up there at the time, he didn't want us to see it. All right, some of the weird things that happened in in the next couple of days, um, when we were down to, to about twelve guys. Um, at that point, the police had already came by, uh, the county sheriff's department had came by, asked, uh, what we were doing, if we were squatters, uh, who owned the land, blah, 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 blah. So, fulfilled all those questions and stuff, and, uh, separate from that, there was a day that we were buzzed by jets. Um... I am not, I'm a G.I. Joe guy, not a G.I. real life guy, you know, like some flies above, I don't know what that shit's called. So, uh, you know, there are two different types of planes. One of the planes um, came in pretty close. If you're considering you're on the ground, you can see the, the pilot, and uh, you can see his helmet pretty good. And you, you can see his helmet turn up and look you in the eyes. Now, you can't see his eyes because he's got, you know, visors on and shit. But, yeah, it was pretty interesting. And then, um, it was weird because once the jets buzzed us, then there was a constant helicopter sound. Like a... Right? And it was always there. And then some of the guys could look up and they could see like a cloud that just didn't look right, you know. So then they started to believe that like, you know, there was something in the cloud and they were using some kind of propeller technology to hold itself up. <laughs> and then they believed that the, uh, the planes were buzzing us from that thing. And, um, uh, I don't doubt that belief. I don't doubt it. Um, I heard what they heard. I saw what they saw. I heard what they heard. They had their conversation separate from me. Somebody came back and discussed it a little bit later. And I, I don't. I don't doubt. That that was was that wasn't going on. I just can't necessarily prove it. Um, uh, but it was very problematic. Wow, that is so beautiful. Um, so one of the things that I started doing was I started collecting um, stones when I get uh, with the metal detector. 
as you can see, this is uh, this is actually brown. You see how it matches my shirt and everything. Get it exposed to the camera. You know, and this looks like uh, some kind of warped metal. Um, don't quite know what it is, but it's one of those that I found and. Pardon me, drinking soda. Um, so I started getting into kind of like rock collecting, stone collecting. Um, just haven't gotten to the point where I crack open a book. Start understanding what I have or what I found. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a couple of specimens. Um, first off, we did make a 40 minute video. I'm going to show you that we've made that on site. Um, there were a lot of pictures taken. I think I'm going to add them to my computer and figure out which days were which. So, uh, kind of be able to, to picture how some of these things happened. Um, Now the stones are, are an interesting thing. Uh, I have theories about stones and I have a theory about Utah, especially where we were. Where we were, a, a brown dust was everywhere. And it's not like dirt. Trust me, I lived in it for almost three weeks. It, it's more like it's more like cremation ash. And when you start reading the Bible and you see that the Most High destroyed the bulk of Judah and said only a remnant would survive, and you start getting into the soil that's out there into in, in, in Utah uh, you're gonna start to understand what happened to the Judeans yeah, the main bulk of them they were obliterated and having the Passover out there with the Big Dipper directly over knowing that's the spot that it's he wants you to know what happened to them he kind of sort of picked what we were going to read and no matter what chapter we are reading it was if you don't listen to me I'm going to destroy you and then it was the actions of him destroying them and then we realized uh, me thinketh we sitting on the cremation uh, goodies. You, yeah. So that's why nothing grows in Utah. That's why they got to ship everything in. They got to ship the gas, the grass. They got to ship the water. You know. <laughs> so, yeah. Nah, it is it is really creepy out there. And it's very paranoid out there for me. There's a lot of paranoia. Ugh. I just can't tell you, man. So here are some of the stones that I've I've got a few select pieces. Um these stones look a lot different in the sunlight and they look a lot different when they're wet. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of these pieces. Play. See if I can get this one. I think you can see it's out if I do that. See, there's no light from back there, so it doesn't light up. The crystals don't light up. See how? Yeah, there you go. So you might turn it up to the light. The crystals light up. If I can get a light source to, uh, Shine back here. I'm just light. Let's just keep it out of my eyes. Right out of there. You'll see these crystalline light up. 
So I just grab it and shine it on the inside. Yeah, there's too much light. And it just doesn't show you. And it just really, I mean, trying to get a look. There's just so many crystals in that. I mean, this, everything right there that's white in that center is crystal. It all lights up. You know, and everything that's dark really kind of doesn't. But there's a few crystals on the outside of that. Uh, what you would want to do is you probably want to look at uh, like seven, uh, excuse me, ten stones more valuable than diamonds. Let's see if I can get this guy going. All right, I don't think it's going to do it. It's just like too much light. It's too much. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You know what? I got a UV light upstairs. Maybe that's what I need. Because if it's not going to show that that good, you know, I guess I could record in the morning. Then it's not going to show this one that good either. Because this one is full of crystals. Like, right, when you look at it just normally, it probably looks like a dumb rock. And you can see that the top is lighting up a little bit. But you don't see. There, it's starting to show a lot of them there. Let's see if I do this one more time. Take that one out and try to get it in a good angle. See, it's just lighting up because it's got a bunch of. See, it? everything that's white is a crystal. And it's just, yeah, you can kind of see it there. It just, it just sparkles like a freaking giant diamond. Um. So then I found this one. This one was pretty cool. Now, this has white and black crystals, like a salt and pepper thing. I was like, oh, what if I put it like there? Yeah, I'll uh, see if it picks up, like, the light from the computer. Okay, every black dot you see is a crystal. It's a crystalline surface. And if I tilt it into the light, you just see it all just... And you imagine in the sun, the sun's just radiating all the crystals at once. Now, I have no idea how this one's going to go. Because this one is just full of crystals. I'm going to see if I can lower this. Put this surface lower. Just going to shine that on there a little bit. No, it's like too much light. No, you see, yeah, I can see the crystals laid up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this whole thing is just one big crystal. Like, all of this is crystallized. And it's just, I mean, it is, it, like, there's even this cove that's, like, all crystal in the cove. There's a little cove on it. Oh, there it is right there. Right here with my fingers. There's this little cove and it's just all crystalline in there. I mean, you know, it's it's like I'm holding just like a, a, a heavy piece of ice. It's like just, oh, just diamond shine. And, you know, I'm fairly ignorant to stones. So, you know, I don't, I don't know what I have. I don't know what I don't have, you know. But I, I, I know when sunlight hits it, it just, it's blinding. You know, nothing. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> it's just, it's a stunner. I just, I can't believe how much, uh, how much it shines. Actually, I mean, I'm going to grab that UV light. I'm going to see if that, like, helps with, like, like on the camera. Yeah. All right, so I got my little UV light. All right, so I'll shine this on there. See, yeah. See if that changes some of that. Yeah, can I see it crystals? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe in the daylight. So I think I get a big chain. And then put put this from a big chain. Right. I mean, this one is just nothing but crystals. I can't even put it on there.
Yeah, once you start getting so close, you see it's crystal structure. I mean, it's it's just amazing to, to me. I mean, so a lot of us, um, you know, kind of, kind of went around collecting, um, just different uh, stones, you know. Um. Oh. So it, it kind of became like a, a hobby to some of us. Uh, we all took a trip uh, when we got a chance. Well, we wanted to take another trip, but uh, we're going to get into that pretty soon. We're going to see if we can make this curse uh, of an area. We're going to make it. We're going to see if we can make it extend to the people that believe they have ownership. We're going to do a lot of things. So we went to this place that's called Desert Mound as a group. Uh, no, the first day we went, it was me and my family. Um, it was very interesting. It wasn't cold. The day we went, um, the last three days of camp were hard. This is kind of like a combo conversation about everything that happened. So, uh, we wanted to go to Kanab and look in the information about Montezuma's uh, treasure, uh, but we didn't, and instead, uh, I took the family to Desert Mound, and then some of the guys went out to Kanab, and they picked up some information, and uh, me and my family, we went and we found this place, it was, uh, it was two mountain plateaus you know when the mountain looks like it's cut off uh, the tip has been cut off and one was here and uh maybe almost a mile on the other side is the other one you know, not even the half a mile not even that far and the inside had been quarried and you know the inside goes around about five stories and all the rocks that were taken from the quarry were put to another part that had the tip cut off and they were just piled up in different and I thought that was really interesting that the people of that community were digging between the two mounds and whatever stones they found they just brought them up and piled up somewhere then I started to think oh they're not using that rock They had, I, I know they had limestone because, because of the type of the uh, green that, that was in it. Um, so it made me wonder, why would they take all this rock and they just pile it up in little piles, in separate piles when they could? That's when I realized, you know, from my own perception, they are digging, they are looking for something. You've got to understand. From my experience, the land that Mark bought, that this guy Chuck lives on, how Chuck told us so many secrets, and it is scorched with different types of rocks. I have enough obsidian stone to complete uh, one of the Aztec swords so much. The only place you're going to find that much obsidian that the Aztec had is in Utah. The problem is it's spread out in small pockets, like in, as if it was thrown from above. In the areas are blast radiuses, like football diamonds you know you get this and then you get the spur the arc spread right like it came from a direction and then it hit and then it shh, spread out like shotgun blast <clears throat> now when you start to think like you know something turned all these people to dust and you can sit there and look at their red dust listen people 
the dirt on the floor of the bowl. You've seen the videos I showed you. There's complete mountains, 360 around the area. You got to drive in through one set of mountains, go to the other set of mountains and drive in, and then you're there somewhere in the center. Well, no, it's by the back edge. But, I mean, I mean, I was, I found pockets of jade, man, in the open desert floor. There's only two ways it could be there. It was part of something that was destroyed. Whether man found it and was holding it when it was hit with something, or whether it was coming from above. There's no other way for it to be there. Scattered in the way that we found it. None. So when you start to put two and two together, and you start to really read these scriptures for what it's saying, Jeremiah was sent to them to tell them that they were going to be destroyed. And when they gave him any problem, he was the one that destroyed them. So, then we, there's, there's no point in looking anymore because You're not finding it. It's being presented to you. And I don't mean from your perspective. I'm saying from my perspective. This event, or eight days, these series of events, it answered every question that I personally had. All of them. I know, I know who everybody is now. I know who the Levites are. I got to see the, the pure blood um Edom when me and Edom sit next to each other it looks like twins he's just red and hairy it is very interesting there is utterly no misconception in the book of Jeremiah it also talks about uh the Israelites purposely mix themselves to get a specific result. It's, it's all in there. It's all in there. Why do the Israelites not specifically match the pictures of the past? Because of the mixing. You know, the Bible, the, the 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 true testimony has all the answers to all the questions we've been looking. You just have to be willing to accept what it says, instead of producing these arguments about this or this or this person or this group edited the Bible. The Most High, I keep telling you, if you turn back to me, I will turn back to you. That's all we did to turn back to him. Everybody that was there got to see their own specific sign. I don't care if they missed the rain, us stopping the rain. I don't care if they missed the rainbow that came afterwards. They still had all the testimony of all the people running around and talking about it all the time. I <laughs> mean, the things that happened. It is truly just amazing. I cannot promise anything like that is going to happen again. But I know through the power that we have and the gifts that were given unto the people that were there that stayed on the land. And positive that we're going to attempt to hold another pass over next year. We have the finance to be able to purchase a lamb now and set him aside.
at the right time. We wait a few months and wait for a lamb to be born by the lamb. By next Passover, he's already under a year. Now, whether I did that or you did that or families did that, that's all we have to do to have Passover the next year. But the Passover and the piece of unleavened bread is a package deal. It is not, I'm here for the Passover. But that is not ordained. And I say that saying you're told that you have to do both. <clears throat> so, if people came with this idea or that idea that I'm only here for this, I have to encourage you, please read. These are ordinances. These aren't, you know, take take the take the Jesus bread if you want to. You know, um now why do we go into the wilderness for eight days? Now this is very simple. You go and you are supposed to be disconnecting that is why you're going you are to not for, to forget that you came from a time when you had no home no land you were a stranger somewhere else and they mistreated you this is important to me and you because we live in societies where we have been overthrown so much so that they've eradicated most access to the true history. You must remember, the Mongolians came from the north. Remember, white people that look like Indians are just pale Indians. Thirteen colonies, right? Same people, just not calling themselves Indians. West Barbarian Coast. You're starting to get this right. And again, the South came with what? The fake Spanish. Fake Spain. His Spain. Hispanola. So, oh, this place has been ravaged from all four sides for a specific reason. Because. Just as it says in Marco Polo, the great Khan was given a mandate from the great blue sky. Spread your heathenism from one end to the other. Now, that has been complete so much so that they've taken over the name China. Chinese been pushed down to the Philippines and all that stuff. And this is all shown to you looking up regular history. So, if the Chinese were defeated by the Mongols, the North Chinese, then the East Chinese, then the West Chinese, then the South Chinese, and then ain't no more Chinese in China. You need to stop bullshitting yourself. Those were dynasties, and as those dynasties were kicked off, they became what? Indigenous to this place, or indigenous to that, but that ain't where they're from. All these books that are available to us that tell us the same story that we're not willing to read for ourselves. So, with this Passover, I have to look at this as a success. Roughly 40 people came from all over the country with hard stories what it took to get there and excuse me it's been an extra long three days and with each of their stories you know they had to overcome something and it was truly it was, it was amazing I actually cried a lot when I saw my son interacting with uh, 
a lot of people. That stuff, I, I would cry a lot, man. I would cry a lot. I saw my son liked Adrian. My son liked to hang out with Adrian because I guess he, he sees himself like looking like Adrian to some degree. Um, so he would really like hanging out with Adrian. And then my son doesn't know jack shit about Santa Claus or anything like that. And then Carell has this like black Santa Claus kind of look. I mean, Carell's mustache and beard first to come down and then it go out into a wave, right? And it's just stopped right here. I still really like Carell too, man. I mean, I mean, he like, he like, he like, you know, he liked hanging out with everybody. But I could tell those were his favorite people because as soon as he saw them, like, if he saw Adrian, he'd just go run over to Adrian, you know. And if he saw Carell, he would just kind of mosey over to Carell. Like, you know, ah, oh, it's it was cool, man, watching his personality interact with, with, with. The people that were no longer strangers, we had spent so many days with them that, you know, we all knew each other. So, to say, hey, I'm pretty much kind of disconnecting, and hey, I have this new family, hey, uh, hey, uh, you know, so, it was pretty cool. And not everybody disconnected, it, it, it didn't, I don't think it mattered that much that we just, I think it mattered so much that I did. You know, to me, because I, I don't know the feelings they have. I just know the feelings that I have. So, in all, the trip is very meaningful. You know, uh, especially to a people that's, that, that is dealing with a form of oppression. You know, a backwards oppression where they're trying, you know, these people try to wipe your memory of what you were. You know, um, it's funny, so many, so many cartoons are based off that. But this is the thing that they've done everywhere. Now, one man will stand up to these people and say, you're not even fucking European. You're just, you're different barbarians that are related. So... We had a great time. We talked about laws. We all understand that we need to divorce the United States. You know, we understand the treason, treason of the birth certificate because you can't make deals with babies. So, I'll just say this. I believe the creator brought whom he wanted there. I believe when he no longer needed them there, he sent them away. Nobody is truly in the wrong place, right? So to bring yourself out to the desert for this, I think a lot of us had a lot of help that we just can't really explain. Almost to a degree of some in miracles in their own way. <laughs> now you've heard me up here countless times about stuff that really upsets me. And this is something that really made me feel good. I mean, even being called a bunch of names or being shoved isn't going to do anything to to take away from that. You know. You know, and then uh, and then like. A, like any group of guys, we we had we had the let's make fun of each other stuff that went on too. And uh, brethren, I don't want, I want you to get upset about anything that's being said when people are taking shots at, at us because we're we're all there as a family, you know. Um, and everybody just trying to make it as easy as possible. 
That's all. Sometimes, you know, we all need a little hand. And sometimes we all take liberties that we shouldn't. So I appreciate that the men that were there did make jokes towards each other, but not so much so that anybody felt that they were ousted and, 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 and marginalized. Um. Are we going to do this again? I would say yes. Um, I would I would really say immediately. I would really say we're planning for the next year is is the key. And this is the build up that gets us closer to having animals um of our own and animals that we've been in control of. So When I change anything, I'll put it to you like this. Um, everybody enjoyed the bow. Um, I would probably, uh, everybody wore their own clothes. It would be interesting if everybody could have some kind of a uniform. Um, there were no Levi priests, but it was obvious that a great deal of the people were Levites. Um, I only felt that there was one Benjamite there. I felt that there were a few people of Edom, and it says, do not abhor your brother. So I, mean, I didn't really point these things out to those people. I felt that there was Moabites there. Um, and... Nobody truly went out of the way to hurt anything from anybody except for feelings a brief amount of times. Um, I don't know if I handled everything right. I feel I handled some things right. I feel I handled some things wrong. What did I learn from all this? Countless things. And we will be covering some of these things too, especially the actions of Jeremiah and who Jeremiah is and why it's so important that the Most High picked a child. You see, because when people go and say, oh, the Most High knew us before when we were children, that's outside of the Bible. The Most High says, Jeremiah. Sometimes used out of context uh, to support other people's arguments, but he's actually saying, Jeremiah, I formed you when you were in the womb, and I did these things. And uh, once we start getting into it, like it'll it'll show. Oh, I've been on the road for three days. I've been about three hours each day. Today I had a little bit more, but I'm exhausted, and I'm trying to keep my eyes open. Um, there's a, a large amount of excitement about sharing what, what happened out there in the desert. Um, everything from, you know, the information Chuck gave us. Chuck told us, these people have all dug in the desert. He said the whole desert floor, it goes down about three feet, and it's a concrete slab that goes from one end to the other. That shit ain't that terrible. Then when you know it's all sitting in, around, uh, uh, surrounded by a series of mountains, you know, it's it just, it's very unusual. Very unusual. Sorry for, I keep going, I'm, I'm, I think I'm done, like, entirely for the day. <laughs> I think I'm going to find some place to fall over. Call 
my bedroom fall asleep. So we will be aiming for next year. We will be aiming as cure lambs. Um, and we we're gonna have to do some changes to uh, to, sh to to make it a little bit stricter, so less verbal things have to happen. Um, and again, uh, we know how long the lamb takes to cook, so we understand when to start the process of the lamb and, and things of that nature. After the temple went up and we were done, the next day we burned the temple, uh, just like it says. So we followed the law as best that we could, based on us all being strange or strangers to each other. And the few people that uh, did not uh, fit everything, these were their sojourn years. And they sojourn with us, and next year is their year. So, oh, I love these. Doesn't it remind you of the McDonald's sign, right? Uh, I'm loving it. Whatever. So, uh, I guess I'll just I'll leave you with this. In society, they keep on saying love. Love is the key. Love is what you say to get in people's underwear. You know it, and I do. Love's the key. As we sit here and talk about how love's the key, eventually we're going to be naked talking about love is the key. You got the key, oh, and I got the key. Right. Look. If love was the key, we'd have a bunch of bastards running around thinking that they're everything. Oh, wait. We have that already. The key is the law. Everything in this world is forms of usury. It is, how do you say, unfair usury? And I know some people are saying, oh, you're picking the wrong word. Think about this. I am a man. I cannot have a child without a woman. If I don't stay on good terms with that woman, we'll never grow into a family. You see what I'm saying? Now, when some woman calls you a deadbeat dad, isn't that heavy usury where you've placed a burden on that person and you're not there to assist? Once the burden has been placed onto the usury, it's, it's a done deal. You've got to understand, without teamwork, there is no team success. This is why they say there's no I in team. Yes, we know there's a me, but there's no I in team. I is the guy that sits back and watches. I've ordered you to do these things, and we just don't want that. Constructive cooperation out of every member is what gets teams the farthest. And we utilize that through the whole event. No. The next couple of days, I'll take the information on my phone, put it on the computer, and we will revisit some, revisit some of these subjects, and, uh, and we'll try to keep it uh, as happy as we can. To the participants, thank you. You know this could not have happened without you. To the donors, you've been amazing. You know we could not have done this without you. And to the people that heckle and scoff, good. Now you know of our success. See you on Judgment Day. I'm going to be the one with the fire whip tearing holes out of Lionel Richie's ass. Yeah. I mean,
All night long. Whoosh. All night. Whoosh. Lot of mother. Whoosh. Smoke rising up to heaven forever, ever, and ever, ever. Shouldn't have took that brand. Right? Devil boy. Dragon boy. Energy's coming back. We'll be back.